Good afternoon, friends. This is again Brandon Duck from Art Show Friends Meeting. Reaching out to you again on this Thursday evening since we can't meet in person. To all my young adults, you know each and every one of you who you are. I miss each and every one of you and I cannot wait until that blessed day we can all join in fellowship and worship together and be reunited as a family. My, uh, my heart right now is aching for two realities. The return of Christ, but hopefully before that, the return of all of us in each other's lives one more time, physically, in, in physical uh, fellowship and companionship, face to face. So, I'm holding up a picture. You might ask, why are you holding up this? This is the picture of my dad. This is the fellow that is going to be, that is online right now, going to help me with this next topic of ours. We are introducing uh, a new, maybe, Bible study couple series for a while on parallel, parallelism and its usages, or its uses in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Why parallelism? Well, a few reasons. Poetry has always spoken to, to me in a special way. Parallelism is a form of poetry. When we realize that these certain books use it a lot, then we come to the understanding that Genesis isn't a history book. Genesis isn't a science book. Genesis is a poem. And if you know what you're looking for, it's, well, to be more technical, it's prose. And if you know what you're looking for, that stands out drastically. And then you start to look at it differently, in a different way. So we're going to look at the next couple verses. Dad's going to introduce parallelism to you. We're going to, he's going to tell us what that is and why it's important. And then I'm going to exegete a few verses of Genesis and then we're going to kick it back to dad and he's going to discuss parallelism in the light of Genesis chapter 1 and these verse, first few verses. Alright dad, so go ahead, take it. Okay, parallelism. Um, parallelism is a literary tool that writers use in the ancient world and it's still used today. It gives, it gives the piece structure and symmetry. Uh, therefore, it makes it easier to memorize, and it makes it also makes it a lot easier to read. Uh, here's an example uh, today. Most of us are familiar with this poem, one of the greatest American poems ever penned by Robert Frost. Um, Two roads diverge in the yellow wood. Be one traveler, long I stood, stood down one as far as I could to where it dealt the undergrowth. Then chose the other just as fair because it was grassy and wanted wear. In that poem, what becomes obvious there is, is the rhythm and the rhyme. And that's why it gets the structure. The rhythm and the meter and the way it's read, the, iamb the iambic pentameter, the natural rhythm of, the, of English language, but also the rhyme gives a structure. But when you read Hebrew poetry, there's no rhyme, and there's not always a rhythm. But it does have this thing called parallelism. And that's what gives a structure. And it also cements it. It helps cement it to our heart. And yes, I'll yes. just give a few examples. There's a synonymous parallelism. And here's an example in uh, the Song of Songs. You read, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. Uh, the second line says just about the same thing as the first in a little different way. That's parallelism. And then there's antithetic parallelism. It's, it uses contrast, juxtaposition, like for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Well, that's Hebrew parallelism. It's a poetic expression. Um, as contrasting the two, it's laying them beside each other. Then there's synthetic parallelism, where the second line builds upon the, up the first, like the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Psalms 23. And then one more, there's emblematic parallelism. Here's an example. The first line illustrates the second. As the deer pants after the water brooks, so pants my soul 
after you, O God. So I suppose a, a simple definition of parabolism would be a, it, it's, it's a poetic expression that uses metaphor, simile, and juxtaposition to communicate a deeper truth. And, and, and all of us are, are big kids at one time or another. And here's, a, here's an expression from a poem everyone knows, all, most of us know. Green eggs and ham, I would not like them here or there. I would not like them anywhere. That's a type of parallelism. It's laying two faults down, juxtaposition side by side, and showing a contrast. So that's pretty much uh, the short and skinny on this thing of parallelism, whether it's in the Old Testament or where, wherever you find it. Exactly. That. When you find parallelism all over the New Testament, all over the Old Testament. We're going to look at different places that is found and each week we come together and we look at a different place we'll do the same thing dad's going to look at it in a literary lens and i'll look at it exegetically through a, a hermeneutic a hermeneutical lens and we'll and we'll juxtapose those two views side by side to hopefully better give us an understanding of scripture again this is so that folks that folks at home during this horrible time of crisis hopefully you're reading your scriptures more and if you are, all this is intended, all we're trying to do is give you some tools to help you understand some things better. So, again, two things you want to keep in mind. Basically what Dad was summarizing was the difference between Eastern and Western poetry. More specifically, Eastern poetry 3,000 years ago, and or 4,000, excuse me, 4,000 years ago, to be more, uh, to be more in, in, that, in that range. Uh, between four to three thousand or four thousand years ago, and then Western poetry today. Uh, and again, a big difference is how in Eastern poetry you don't necessarily rhyme, but you use ideas and parallel word pictures. Again, all this to make it, like Dad said, easier to remember because you have to remember that for the first several millennia that the oral that the, that the Torah was uh, around it was an oral form it was an oral tradition it was passed down family to family it was passed down community to community long before it was put down in paper and it really probably wasn't put down in paper but until our ish around 500 BCE or before the common era so all that to say it was important the way it was is designed so that it's easy to remember. So remember, it was the or, the oral tradition. This Genesis, this story we're about to read of creation, the first few verses. It wasn't. This was an oral story. This was a story passed down from ages to ages, long before it ever touched paper. You know, probably wasn't put down on paper until 500 BCE, around 500 years before the Common Era, around the time. The time people couldn't read. Beg pardon? Even when it was written, most people couldn't read. Most people couldn't read for a long exactly. Exactly. So that's why these these this these tools, parallelism, using that in, in, in the text was a really important uh, for its survival. Well the first couple verses of of Genesis, we're gonna look at it hermeneutically. We're really gonna look at it exegetically and, and, and we're gonna find a hermeneutic. Together, we're going to find a lens. Her, her, hermeneutics basically being the lens in how we interpret things, the art of interpretation. So we're going to look at some different hermeneutics. So, you, you got it? Mm -hmm. Genesis 1, 1, verses 1 through 1 and 2, starting. We might go further. Parallelism, parallelism and how we understand Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. We're going to go to the next slide, Sam. So we have two translations. We have the CSB above it, and we have a uh, translation directly from the Hebrew uh, below it. To get, again, to just suppose, to, to give you a little bit different in different ways it's been interpreted. Uh, so in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis chapter 1, 1 in the CSB, chapter 1, verse 1. Directly from the Hebrew, in the beginning of God's creating, the skies 
and the earth. You see the subtle difference there? Uh, and it's just because how the uh, it's because how the subject takes action from the verb and the way it was written, we can better translate it as in the beginning of God's creating the skies and the earth. Again, not a huge difference, but you'll see a stark difference as we keep going uh, between again just basically word for word out of the Hebrew and uh, an English translation, a good English translation like the CSB. Let's go to that next slide, Sam, slide three. So in all actuality, the Torah or the Pentateuch or the first the first five books of the Bible, uh, the Jewish people call this the Torah or the law, um, but it's the first five books of the Bible, and, and in Hebrew custom, in Hebrew tradition, they're the most probably the most important books uh, in the Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, because they, they give us the law, and of course, uh, Torah is Hebrew for law. So in all actuality, the Torah or the Pentateuch, it could have started with the first commandment for Israel to observe Passover, which doesn't really happen until Exodus chapter 12. According to Rashi, again, you'll hear me, you'll see me refer to Rashi a lot. Rashi was a was a uh, French rabbi from about the 11th century. Around that time, the ten, about the thousands, right in the, the cusp of the Dark Ages, and uh, so I refer to him a lot. And again, Rashi and a lot of rabbis that come after him would would argue that the reason why we have the creation story and basically everything from Genesis to Exodus 12 isn't so much to tell us about the Hebrews and, and their backstory, but really to prove how God is the owner of the earth. So this creation story is proving God's ownership of everything. And that's the real Hebrew idea that, that God owns everything. He owns me. He owns this house. My family. The way the king, the way King David put it, he said, he talks about God having cattle, a thousand cattle on a thousand hills. Was David either David or Solomon? Dad, correct me if I'm wrong. You're right. So, this idea of God's ownership is central to Genesis chapter one because it's why we have it to demonstrate how God owns. He owns everything. So. We go to slide number four, Sam. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered over the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God ho hovered over the waters. Ch chapter 1, verse 2, CSB, Genesis. Now again, this is the he right from the Hebrew. When the breath... Had, well, no, excuse me. When the earth had been shapeless and formless, and the darkness was on the face of the deep, God's spirit was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, a couple things to point out. The next slide, Sam. The words for formless and empty, what Genesis and the, you, most English translations are some uh, say, you know, the earth was formless and empty or void and without form. Uh, the Hebrew words that we get that from is tohu and bavohu and basically what those are two words that mean the exact same thing and it means wild and waste uh, it means desolate it means uncontrolled so again when you're thinking of the earth before creation before God stepped in and before God restored order when you think of that when you really do you think of 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 these words of, of, of you, this order and, and, and lawlessness you really think of America the American West around the beginning of the 19th century with you know the outlaws and the cowboys and tombstone and disorder unruly 
And so what you'll find is what God does and what this, the, the creation, what really the Genesis is accounting is not so much, it's more, more, more than creating. God's creating everything, but more than that, he's taking something that was uncontrollable and he's bringing order to it. He's bringing order from the chaos. Because remember what the scriptures say. The scriptures say that it was that the earth that it was earth was there, but it was it was void. It was formless. It was just a, a, a floating blob, an uncontrollable substance. So there was something there. But what God did to that is He brought order to the chaos, and that's what God does. Really, you think about it. Genesis chapter one through eleven is just about God. The first three chapters, God's bringing order. And then from chapter 3 to 11 is God's getting rid of sin. And it's beautiful how the author... It's beautiful how the author brings about those ideas and how he stages this play. So Genesis... Uh, is one of my favorite books. It's a long poem. And it's a poem for a reason. It's written that way for a reason. So, what slide are we on? I think we're on slide four, Sam. So we're going to go to slide... No, we're on slide five, so we're going to go to slide six, our final slide. So the Hebrew for spirit is the same one for breath. Um, in the New Testament, the, the Hebrew word... the in, Excuse me, in the New Testament, the Greek word for spirit is the same word for wind, uh, penumea. But in Hebrew, it's, it, it's breath, not so much wind. And, and while, while it, it looks that way, it portrays itself to be that way, and shows us how, the, how that ancient way of life was centered around just survival, around breathing. So God's breath. Uh, it's hovering over the face of the deep. And that's a really strong word picture. So, Pop, take it take it over, man. I'll kick it back to you for a little bit. Well, uh, I'm just going to focus on the uh, on the parallelism that's here in the English translation. And I, I do think it gives us that symmetry. And, you know, it's, it's yeah. easier to remember. It's, it's easier to hang on to and imprint it upon your heart. You know, the earth was without form and void, and here's the parallel, and the darkness was on the face of the deep. Uh, you go on verse 3, God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light, and the light was good. It's more than repetition, though it repeats, but it is a form of that Hebrew literary discipline of parallelism. And, uh, and, and since we're restarting here in, in, in Genesis and the creation poem, I just thought I'd share a on the literary side of it, you know, just something about poetry. You know, poetry, it uses words to move beyond words. It uses words to tell you something that you have a hard time putting into words. It, it draws a picture and it takes you to a place. There's never been a society that did not have poetry. It's both ancient, but it's also new. It's like when the morning frost lies across the meadow and reaches into the old growth forest. So poetry, while moving forward, it also looks back and reflects the human condition. That's why a lot of the poems are talking about yesterday or yesteryears are reflecting on the past. Um, I mean, you think, you think about this. Um, 700 years before the birth of Christ, the Odyssey was written. It's, a long, it's an epic poem. In Dante is epic poetry, and Milton is epic poetry, and it just goes on and on and on. And uh, so, to give an example of the sheer power of poetic expression, um, when Bobby Kennedy was running for president, you know, he was scheduled to speak in the uh, urban area, a very poor urban area in Indianapolis, Indiana. And it happened to be on that occasion, the same day Martin Luther King Jr. was shot. And of course, at that time, there was no uh, social media, no cell phones. 
there's no 24 hour cycle on 24 hour news media and so he's standing on a flatbed trailer he's speaking to um, a group of minorities in an urban area it's poverty stricken here's a white man from one of the most elite families in the country running for president asking him for a vote but on that day a hundred cities in America burned uh, through the riots when Martin Luther King was shot and he had to the, he knew when he delivered the news, some of these people would be hearing it for the first time. You can YouTube this. Just YouTube Bobby Kennedy and Eskalus. And you'll find this. When he's standing on the back of that trailer and he shares the news that Martin Luther King had been shot, you can hear the sighs of the people sigh. They groan, and you, you can you can feel the shock at that moment. And so, you know, how does Kennedy, when 100 cities are burning, what's he do to kind of soothe and bring a calmness, a calm spirit to this, he shares poetry. And he said that, um, you know, my brother too was shot by a white man. And he said, uh, I know what you're feeling. And then he said these words. He said, one of my favorite poets is Aeschylus. And he shared a line that Aeschylus wrote. Aeschylus had died before Plato was born. And, uh, and Aeschylus wrote this line around 500 B.C. He said, even in our sleep, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our own despair against our will comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. And through that poetic expression, Bobby Kennedy connected with that group of people. And though a hundred cities burned that night, Indianapolis did not burn and that's just an example of, of the power of poetry. So we should be surprised when we look in the, the greatest of all stories, the most epic story, it opens with poetry. And some of our most uh, precious uh, verses that we've memorized, committed to memory, it's, it's a poetic expression written in a form that has made it easier for us to not only read, understand, but also memorize. And considering that, then we shouldn't be surprised when you consider Jesus when he began teaching, like um, the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is written in parallelism. Jesus was very familiar with the discipline. The Lord's Prayer is written in parallelism. Our Father who art in heaven, here's the parallelism. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth and as it, as it is in heaven. Give us this day, here's the parallelism, our daily bread. I mean, parallelism is everywhere, and I, I'm into it. I've been a student of it for a while, and uh, so it should come as no surprise that the greatest epic stories ever written was written in poetic form. That's why one reason you'll find it throughout the entire New Testament and much of the New. And I'm looking forward to going through this with you, Brandon. So am I, Pop. I really am. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed that. Next week, we're going to look at another classic usage of parallelism and a different type of parallelism, one of the four types that I mentioned. And I can't wait till then. And in all things, we'll be praying together and looking for that blessed day we can meet one another, one another again. If not in person, then in the sky. All right, Dad. Love you, buddy. I'll talk to you soon. Love you, man. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. Archdale, love you. Talk to you all soon.